All right, Dr. Miller, I think you're in the place to be. How's it going tonight? Hi, Chris. It's going well. Thank you. How are you? Good. I'm doing good. So um, I'm glad you're here. Like I said, before we were started talking, I was interested in this subject. and I think a lot of other people will find value into this. But I guess we should start, you know, that I know you're a licensed professional counselor and we should just go from like maybe, you know, how did you start there? What was the motivation? Was that you're always planning to be there? Just like a little small introductory about yourself. OK, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Dr. Deborah Miller and I am a licensed professional counselor in Missouri and, and Pennsylvania. And I have uh, had a private practice for over 25 years. I'm semi-retired now. And my background is in education. I used to teach uh, behavior disordered teenagers, as they called them back in the day, and um, mm -hmm. also worked in drug alcohol prevention. So I also often worked with adolescents. And then uh, in private practice, I started working with families. And then that morphed into couples, which morphed into a lot of dealing with recovery from affairs. And that's what inspired my book, which I've been writing for over for years. COVID certainly helped um, give me the time and space to get that pulled together. So I have authored a book called More Than Sorry, Five Steps to Deepen Your Apology After You Have Committed Infidelity. And my motivation for writing this was that I, as I worked with couples that would come into my office, the person that was wounded, the person that was cheated on, needed a lot of support. They need a lot of um, empathy and, and ability to just vent and have, you know, ask the questions over and over again. Why, why, why? And they definitely needed that time and space to mm get support and validation for the pain that they experienced. But meanwhile, I would look over at the other person who had committed the infidelity and they often were mute um, and had nothing much to say because they just wanted, you know, it was uncomfortable and how to face your own um, transgressions and how to be able to say, I'm sorry, in a way that would stop it. And that's what the expectation often was. They just wanted to say, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. When, when can we stop talking about this? Um, and it was so stagnated. The work became stagnated. And I realized that the balance wasn't there in helping both parties grow from the trauma of an affair. So do you work mainly with relationships or couples that people, have, you know, one person or the other has cheated on each other? Is that mainly your forte? Or no, I was pretty, I mean, again, I worked a lot with families and a lot of adults okay. at the end of my career, but, um, but a lot of couples that was, you know, I'd say 80% of the couples that came in, that was the issue. They had, mm. uh, discovered the secret relationship and, uh, were struggling with what to do next. Do you think that's a common, I guess, starting to take a deep dive down here, but I mean, in today's times, I mean, do you see more couples being cheated or ha having cheat on each other compared to the previous or the past years? Well, the, the statistics are, are tough. I mean, the, the hardcore statistic of about 50% of marriages in, end in divorce, that's been really consistent over time. Sure. Um, and, you know, when you search for data, like who, how many are having affairs, or, you know, it's again, not many people want to raise their hand and say, me, me, I had an affair, you know, so... You know, it's about 30 to 60 percent that we know of uh, of couples experience some sort of infidelity. Now, in today's world, that includes online relationships. Sure. And so I want to make sure that your audience knows the definition of an affair, which is that it's a secret relationship. It's okay. a relationship that has not been agreed upon uh, by both parties and that there's um, so just hiding of it. So certainly online relationships is big. And so that's tough because often people who have an online relationship don't feel like they're cheating or having an affair because they may not be having sex or any physical contact, but it's still a betrayal. Yeah. It's still a betrayal. Yeah. That's what and, I was kind of getting at that, you know, with the internet, phone, social media, it seems so much easier to have a, you know, an affair or a second life or whatever you want to say compared yeah. to pre-internet days and that it, you know, I'm not going to say it's easier to hide, but it's, you know, almost in a sense until it finally you get caught or whatever. But that's the reason I was wondering if it was so much easier just to, you know, cheat or cheat on someone, your significant other in today's times. Well, you know, temptation is as old as 
it's recorded in the Bible, right? I mean, that's sure. just been there. So again, how to know how people handle temptation and how to deal with it. And, and my book also gets into like um, online pornography and, you know, that kind of some sort of sexual addiction that can also be a, a betrayal of trust and infidelity. You know, if someone starts joining um, chat groups, sex chat groups, or, you know, no. hiring online people. So it's pretty wide, but the, the, point of my book is that we are we as a society um understandably judge the person who cheated we judge them and we you know condemn them and wave our fingers at them and they should feel guilt you know that you know if you hurt someone um you should feel bad you should feel um remorse you should feel there's a desire to change but to walk around with their head down and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, isn't necessarily going to make things different. And so the, my book's intention is to have it help a person really look at themselves and ask some hard questions so that they can figure out their why. Because that is the big question that the wounded person typically asks. Why did you step over the line? Why did you cheat on me? Why did you have this secret relationship? And honestly, the cheater often says, I don't know. Mm. And there's truth to it because they haven't looked at it. You know, it's just, kind of, it can be impulsive. It can be situational. It can be, you know, we have this, we're all wired as humans to have this amazing defense mechanisms at all time. Sure. We're, we're really able to self-protect our egos and to minimize any wrongdoing. It's really um challenging to look in the mirror and say, wow, I really messed up. I really, you know, made some horrible choices and I re I really hurt people. Most of us want to just push it away and say it's no big deal. And that's why the person that's going to buy this book is only going to buy it probably because their significant other caught them <laughs> in their infidelity and pushed that they uh, work on themselves. Well, do you think that, you know, when person A or person B or whoever, finally, if, you know, in, when and if they get caught cheating, like you said, they ask, you know, why or whatever, they only have those thoughts and emotions just because they actually got caught, like d during cheating or having a side affair or whatever you want to say. You know, it was all great fun. It was a good time. And then once I got caught, it's like, oh, now I feel bad. Yeah. And now, now I see myself as other people see me mm. You know, before when you're sneaking off and no one knows you're doing the wrong thing, you know, then, um, you know, you can still protect your ego, but then all of a sudden you've got these people looking at you and you have a different label. You're the cheater, you're the adulterer, you're, sure. and all of a sudden it's, that's hard, you know, that's sure. shame building. Yeah. Yeah. And it stays with you. And for a while, and, you know, if you have that image and then all your friends know that you cheated and, you know, your family knows, and then, you know, now you're going through a divorce and somewhere your life didn't want to, you know, you didn't plan. It's almost a complete 180. And you're just like, why, why did I do this? Yeah. And, and a lot of times it doesn't end in divorce. And so the only people that know about the transgression is the couple themselves. And they're holding this horrible secret that they need help and support with, because for whatever reason, they are choosing not to get a divorce, whether it be religion or kids or money um, or hope but yet they aren't able to get support. And so that's why the five steps in my book, first step one is empathy. First of all, if you're, for your initial reaction to getting caught will be denial, will be minimizing, will be sure. um, not really confessing it completely. It's, but you have to work on empathy and, and empathy is a tough skill. Empathy, you know, we use that word pretty frequently, but it's just really try to get a sense of what the other person is feeling and learn the skills to articulate it. And that takes practice. It does. You know, most of us go, Oh yeah, I know how you feel. Oh really? What, how do I feel? You know, what do you say it? I agree. Oh, you're feeling ticked off at me because I, I spent $500 renting hotel rooms this month. You know, that's um, a more valid reflection, but the empathy is to really, feel the, what the other person is experiencing and you know it means you have to have a pretty decent emotional vocabulary you have to have a pretty decent ability to be able to know what you're feeling sure. in order to sense what other people are feeling yeah well is it, again going with we're well, not even again but 
you know, most males, I believe that, you know, when talking emotions and stuff that, you know, we're never really taught, you know, to express our feelings like that. And it's, and for me, one, personally speaking that I've tried, I know it's something I've been working on, but it's hard for me to actually talk about my feelings and what I'm feeling just because of what we were just saying, what people will think and, you know, and how they'll view me, you know, like the judgment there is just like, man, am I really willing to throw this all out there and see what happens? But it's one of those things that you kind of have to push through the wall and break down that wall to make something better. Yeah. And I'm hoping it's changing. I mean, my experience of younger people is that the male female stereotype of, you know, the male has to be stoic and tough and Mm. uh, the Marlboro man kind of uh, to use an old. I know what you mean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. I know know exactly what you mean. (laughs) Okay. I think we're challenging that more and we're seeing different um, role models in uh, TV shows and uh, movies, et cetera. And so I'm hoping that suggests a different way of being because we really, we're all striving for intimacy. And, and of course, when I say the word intimacy, we assume physical, and that's a part of it, definitely. But there's an emotional intimacy. Do you let someone know you? Do you, do you know, let someone uh, know what you're feeling and ex, um, experiencing, and do you say it out loud and share it? And that brings in a, a different level of closeness um, and connection. And so, you know, how to help people recognize that in order to, well, have you heard of Brene Brown, for example? Okay. Brene Brown is a sociologist. She's, you should Google some of her TED Talks. Okay. She talks a lot about vulnerability and expressing your vulnerability. And, and that is a connector. If I tell you, gee, I think I'm really scared about um, starting this new job tomorrow, you know, or that's a different way than saying, hey, I've got a new job tomorrow. We'll be fine. You know, it's, it's a different way of opening up a connecting um, at a different, deeper level. Mm. And certainly what I experience with people who have had affairs, that's why I like to work with the person who cheated alone a little bit to say, well, what did you learn about yourself in that relationship, in that secret relationship? Were you different? Were you, was there a different level of intimacy with this person? And let's talk about that. What do you think that was about? Well, in talking with them alone, though, they'll probably tell you more than what they would with their spouse or the other one in the room anyway, correct? Yeah. I mean, it takes it's it's hard to sit with someone who is so mad at you and so hurt by you. I mm. mean, it's, it takes a lot of courage uh, to just sit there with them and know that as much as you'd like to erase what happened or make them feel better, you have to allow them time and and you have to give them recognize that it's their choice whether they're going to forgive you or not but that's where the, the so the steps of my I, my five steps are first one is empathy sure you can communicate it to other people as well as find empathy for yourself because it's tough to go through this um, and then the second step is I call it navel gazing kind of a self-analysis like, what am I, you know, what's going on with me? What's my personality style? What's my attachment style? Um, how how able am I to communicate emotions and, and history of that? And then the third step is um, setting restitution goals. How am I going to be different as a result of this experience? Um, nope, wrong. No, step three is saying it out loud. Okay. You have to be able to communicate to people. And certainly coming to therapy is a safe way, but I really encourage people to at least find one person out there in your real life who loves you no matter what you've done and who can be a listener. Uh, so, because there's some accountability. Because honestly, if someone comes into my office and wants me to like them, they're going to tell me a different version of themselves. Of course. Yeah. So it's, it's, but that's, so it's easier to talk to me, a stranger, than to talk to your best friend. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, those, it's like you said earlier, it's one of those things that, you know, I've, in one of these books I've been reading lately, it's like Sacred Cow. They talk about people who want to diet and what they're actually eating, you know, before they start their diets or whatever. But, you know, when they're asked, like, you know, how many drinks do you have a week? You know, how many desserts do you have a week? They always you know I don't want to say lie, but, you know, they exaggerate a little bit or whatever you want to say. Like, oh, yes. I have one or two when they're really having six or eight just because of that. Oh, like, I don't want them to think I'm actually down here just pounding a 12 packs of beer every day. You know, yeah. Right. What are they going to think right. of? Yeah, you know, because on your work, you have to like reassure them that that you're not going to judge them. You're just trying to help them exactly. be more honest with themselves, you know, that they have to have some clarity about that. And so that's happens too in my my office. I have to like reassure them that um, 
that, you know, yeah, I'm curious about the affair, but only about how they're feeling about it and how they, what they want to do about it, if anything. Um, but they're going to minimize it. You're right. You're yeah. going to minimize it. All right. So step three was saying that loud. Step four was set restitution goals. And then the fifth step is to actually ask for forgiveness. And in my book, I provide some sample letters on how to, I have case studies in the book, you know, just to help people kind of understand processes because everyone goes through different things. But, you know, the, the asking forgiveness and saying more than I'm sorry is saying more about yourself. It's, it's, it's communicating empathy. And it's also saying, here's what I've learned about myself. Mm. And this process of learning about yourself doesn't end. It's a lifelong sure. journey. Sure. And so how I answer why, why did I, why did you cheat a week after you get caught and how, how you would answer that three months and five years later and ask the same question, why did you cheat? The answer is going to be different. Of course. And it should be different. It should evolve. It should, you know, deepen. It should be uh, reflective of some clarity that you've gained about yourself and the growth that you've had. Yeah. Well, if you really want to change, it should be, you know, if it, or people are set in their ways or whatever, just like, oh, whatever. I just cheated because I wanted to. I don't care how it affects other people. I'm not going to change anything. But Actually, if, you're, if you, but yeah, if you really feel like, ooh, I really, you know, messed up here. I want to change, you know, and here, I mean, give myself goals, baby steps, whatever you want to say in two years, five years, I work on it. You know, I mean, that's what one thing I always say on here. I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. I'm not the same person I was 15 years ago, but it's because I wanted to grow. I wanted to learn new things. I wanted to change the person I was and become something that, you know, like role models or mentors, like we were saying earlier, like someone I want to look up, I look up to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's honestly the first, the introduction of my book, I asked that question you know, basically, why are you here? What do, what do you, what are your expectations? Yeah. Why do you want to look at your affair? Because you're right. A lot of people don't. It's hard. It's painful. You need a lot of a personal maturity to, to look in the mirror and say, whoo, I really, really messed up. Yeah. Well, there's so many vices though. And it's like you, I think you touched on a little bit earlier that, you know, almost everywhere you go, you know, there's temptation there in some form or another, you know, lust, you know, going to work, you know, you spend, you know, well, I forgot what that saying is, but you spend more time at work than you do with your own family. If you typically work at 40 hours a week. So yeah, you know, and you're spending more time with those people and you're building new relationships, you're building these little office hangouts, so to speak. And those, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, weak people, you know, cheat on each other or whatever, but I think that it's just so much there that almost, you know, how do you control it to a certain extent? I mean, I think that's what Tiger Woods was saying when he was going down his, uh, I guess if you want to say his sex addiction. Sex addiction, or, right. Yeah, and that he was just having so much temptation just thrown at him. He just couldn't fight it anymore. Yeah. You know? And I'm not saying, I'm not you know advocating saying, yeah, just you know, give in to the temptation or whatever. But, no. Yeah. No. Well, and that's, there definitely is a moral code that needs to be, reflected on, you know, like, what are my standards? You know, what are my, what's okay and what's not? You're frozen on my end. Yep. No, we're back. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, I lost my train of thought there. Okay. So yeah, you have to be able to. Like what's thing. Yeah. 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 You have to have a moral code, but there you, you also have to be able to just accept that that you're not perfect. Yeah. You know, there's a humanness to all of us that we all have, um, you know, in the kind of the Christian sense, we're all sinners. You know, we all have to recognize that there is, is imperfection and there is du duality in all of this. In other words, you can be like a really amazing employee and a really shitty spouse. <laughs> you can be um, a great friend to so many and not necessarily a great parent. You know, there's just the reality is we have kind of a duality to ourselves and we have to figure out how to accept them and maybe integrate the two and find the middle ground between the two. You can be honest and you can lie. You can be, uh, yeah, you can eat perfectly one week and then go off the wagon the next, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's so easy to do. And just because, you know, I don't know, I want to say a, a lot of people were just running off momentum. 
in today's time. Like it's a society, you know, because there's always something going on. There's always a place to be. There's always some kind of new trend coming out that you got to stay ahead of. There's, just, it's just always just like, Hey, you know, let's take a minute and relax and stop. And, you know and I mean? One of the pros for COVID was that people did get the chance to take a stop or stop at their life and like, okay, let me really think about how yeah. it's going here. I mean, you know, am I really happy? Is this where my relationship is right. healthy? Is this where I really wanted it to be in that, you know, then, you know, I don't, I can't remember, did divorce rates go up during COVID or what? I can't remember, but I think it gave No, it couldn't because no one could afford it. We couldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember, like, if people were But just, I think, you know, um, yeah, it was, it was very stressful for many people because, again, your life, their life, everyone's yeah. lifestyle was thrown upside down. Yeah. And, you know, you couldn't, you, you know, as much as we want to say, I'm going to rely on my significant other for everything, you know, you need community. And so when the, the isolation of that was really tough. Yeah. Really I mean, if you're not used to spending, you know, like I was talking about, you know, spending all that time at work for 40 hours plus a week, and now you're spending more time with your significant other, it's like your whole world, your whole routine changes. And it's yeah. like, ooh, you know, did, you know, like we said earlier, did our relationship change over the last five years? Are we the same people we used to be? Have we grown apart? Have we grown closer? I don't know. But Chris, that's a great question. And that's what I find couples don't know how to do is how to check in with each other. And mm-hmm. this is healthy couples, too. How do, how do you periodically say, how are we doing? You know, are, are we where we want to be as a couple? Are you getting what you need from me? You know, we tend to just get so um, busy yeah. um, and getting things done. Like, you know, there's a lot of great roommates out there, but they don't have the intimacy and the connection because they don't know how they don't, they don't realize they should try to ask each other those deeper questions and, and figure out how to know each other at a different level. Well, that's one thing that I've always thought one of the keys to a good relationship was, and, and this, again, me personally speaking, was communication just because of my previous relationship. You know, I got dumped, you know, six months back or whatever, but it was because I thought there was communication breakdown and just that, you know, we were on two different pages there. And I was like, well, you know, this is not where I wanted it to go, but that's how you're feeling. I understand it. But again, I was just like, I think a lot of this could have worked out, been worked out if we just would have, like you said, like just talking, like, hey, you know, let's have a sit down and just talk, you know, let's have a deep talk about stuff. Yeah, you know, and it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll throw it out on the table if we got, you know, if, if there's beef, throw it on the grill, right? Right, so, yeah. right. And I think right. we have a lot of problems. Yeah, but as your experience and many pe- other people's experience, you know, it takes two of you to figure that out. It takes sure. two of you to want to make change and to find out ways to be curious about each other and learn more about who you are. Here's a question, and I can't remember where I picked this up at, or if it's a book, a podcast, or what. But I think, and I hope I don't butcher this. I might. So sorry, folks, if I do it, but they were saying or making a point that, you know, can you really love somebody if you already know everything about them? Does that, does that kind of make sense? Well, I never heard that quotation. That's interesting. I'm thinking about that. Can yeah. you really love someone if you already know everything about them? Well, the reality is you don't know everything about the <laughs> other person. <laughs> you know, we all have inner thoughts and inner feelings. and You may know data about them sure. but you know think about it you know then on a daily basis you come home from work and hi honey how was your day you know some days you say fine other days you say three sentences about it and other days you say uh i don't want to talk about it all i don't know you know the reality is a lot goes on sure. a lot goes on in our own personal lives and we all see the world through our perspective and that may be different but you know, what I found in couples that are struggling is that over time, resentment builds up. Ooh. And when that resentment gets heavy and, um, you know, they can, the other person can chew gum wrong. You know, they're just, <laughs> doesn't matter what they do. You're like, oh, I hate that about you. Yeah. you know? So that's, that's something that you have to like personally decide. I'm going to let go of my resentment or I'm going to say it out loud. Um, I'm going to figure out if we can like each other again. Yeah. Because when you talk about love, which is a feeling and it's it's powerful, but there's all different kinds of love. You know, there's a romantic love. There's the love that comes out of companionship and security. There's the love of loyalty. But, you know, like, how do you like, do you like the person you're with? You know, and of course you don't like them every day, (laughs) you know, but mostly do you like them? And so how do you show, um, show them that you like them? Do you, you know, besides saying, oh, I like your, I like your t-shirt, you know, it's, you have to be able to say, I, I like that you are such a generous person, or I like that you 
have such a great sense of humor. Or, was you know, that knowing their love language? You know, whatever that book is, like knowing their what is it? Five love languages? Or something yeah, like have that. you ever seen that? Uh, well, I didn't read it, but I found out what they were, and I was like, well, I don't really need to read this now if I know what each love like the five of them it's are. Actually, so. a, you know, as far as self help books go, it's a good one. Well, I've it's had a, a friend tell me that it was really good. I should still yeah. read it, and I was like, well, yeah. I mean, how do you know what they are? You know, I just don't need yeah. it explained. I well, do you that. know what yours is? Uh, quality time. Okay, very good. And so, you know, the premise of the book is you need to know your own love language, but you need to know your significant other's love language uh -huh. also, yeah. and try to do more of that love language, which is hard. Sure. Like if the other person really wants uh, gifts, for example, and you're like, really? I could care less about buying you. That's me. That's me right there. Just because uh -huh. I do not care. I don't need to show you buying you a fancy, whatever it is that I love you. You know, like I had this notion in my head that, and I, I don't know where I came up with it at, but it was just like, I was like, quality time seems to make the most sense to me just because, you know, we have a finite amount of time on this planet or whatever you want to say. And just how we're spending it's going to mean more to me than, you know, a fancy ring or bracelet yeah. or whatever. It's just, you know, hey, let's go see, uh, you know, Horseshoe Bend. Let's go see the Grand Canyon. Like, I'm going to have that memory for life, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not that I'm pushing the book because, again, it's good <laughs> but go online, fivelovelanguages.com, I think, and they have a little quiz. And you yep. take a really simple quiz and it gives you your score on your love languages. Uh, it's just, just kind of fun. And it's just one of those easy, oh, that makes sense. You know, like taking personality tests. Have you ever done like- Oh, I've done plenty of those. Or colors. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, uh, like I've worked in higher education, like I was telling you earlier, and it seems like every- beginning of the semester we have to do some type of icebreaker and it includes one of those yeah. tests. so sick of them but i mean i get it but it's just like oh my i know God. you yeah. get it yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 but they're fun because you know when i first started just like, oh well, i didn't really know that about myself i guess that kind of makes sense you know so. yeah well and it more and it's when you learn about the other person you're like oh now i understand why <laughs> that person doesn't really want to talk to me at the water cooler or, you know because they they're introverted or you sure. know that 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 information is important but but that's also the process of healing in a relationship is you know what did you like why did you why do you think you fell in love in the first place what did what was so attractive about your significant other when you first met and when you first got together and to reflect on that because the reality is opposites do attract and so uh, what may be so interesting to me, because you 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 may pull me into the canyons for a hike when I would prefer to be sitting home, you know, reading a book or sure. you may be the life of the party and I'd rather um, you know, have a quiet dinner or two, you know, but yet I should do more of that and you should do more of what I want. And that's the, the great thing that happens when we first fall in love with someone. We have this great lust. You're fabulous. I can't stand to be apart from you. And then over time, the next stage of a relationship, you start to have your conflicts. You know, all of a sudden the things that were so cool about your differences become so annoying. <laughs> and so you really have to really figure out, hmm, okay, what should I do? What, what adjustments should I make? And what adjustments should you make? Yeah. Um, and there's one research I read a long time ago. It's like, who? how can you, can you predict who makes it? in relationships can you and a big indicator is your personal commitment to the institution of marriage if you say i'm in it yeah you know i'm really in it i mean i know we say those words on the altar or wherever you get married but are you really going to stick it out and um and that's an interesting thing and then sometimes we well, get well, well is that just you know you know, all right. So, you know, I'm really in it because I, you know, love of my life. I found my soulmate. I'm in it no matter what we're doing this, but, or is it one of those things that due to society or culture, whatever, I'm only getting married just because, you know, I've reached X point in my life and I am supposed to get married and I found somebody who right now is cool. I'm just, yeah. Going, yeah. Yeah. I get what you're yeah, saying. I mean, you may realize you, oops, made a mistake at, you know, after you've already done the, the whole thing, but, um, yeah, I think there's more permission now. I mean, divorce isn't as taboo, you know, like back in the 50s, you know, you just couldn't, it was yeah, just it was aimed upon. But, you know, most, a lot of people come from divorced families. They've seen that, you know, we all survive. It can be painful. Um, so, yeah, there is some pressure that way. But I think, um, you know, a lot of uh, couples go through kind of premarital counseling just to make sure they 
have said things out loud, have set the same goals, um, and have that experience of getting to know each other, uh, both spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, experientially. You know? Yeah, well, it helps to have those tough conversations. You know, I've never, and I'm, you know, I've never been married. Um, mm-hmm. Never went through that pre-marital therapy or whatever. Yeah. But I think, you know, because some of those topics or conversations that come up, you know, especially for me, I would forget to even bring up. And then when they are brought up, it's like, oh, oh shit. You know, I didn't know you felt that way. <laughs> and like, you know, yeah. just, again, just a complete 180. And like, what well, do I really want to spend my life with this person? You know, and, right. and, and your spouse might feel the same way, you know, or a different way about things. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. we got a lot of work to do. Then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's a good point that mm-hmm. I never really thought about. That's another way just to engage those type of conversations, just because, you know, usually when I'm with, you know, w- was with my, you know, uh, uh, girlfriend that we were just I was just looking for a good time you know we were just having fun we just really it's like you know this ain't right now to have this tough conversation on finances or you know kids or whatever where do you see yourself in 10 years and all that good stuff because you know you don't want to ruin the moment then but I guess it's just trying to figure out where that time and place is to have that conversation or, or remember it so well and yeah you know, in there, your little self-disclosure there may have reflected more that you really weren't in this time and space that you were interested in a committed relationship. Sure. So there is some dumb luck aspect to getting together with a person. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm ready. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. And then let's figure out if we love and like each other or we like each other. Um, and that's doesn't sound very romantic. I get that. Um, you know, you want to have this like uh, the lightning bolt hit you. But, you know, there is something. And then that happens for some, but definitely not for all. Well, a lot of what we probably see in you know in movies and TV about how it's supposed to go, and then you're oh wait, it did go that way. This is great, or it didn't go that way, and you think it's complete utter failure. Yeah, right. well, that's the tough two part. And then I have a piece of this in my book is about um, the brain, how when we're in lust or having an affair, it's very similar to a, an addiction. You have a flood of dopamine and serotonin, really high. You feel great. You know, it's really exciting and um, and so that kind of, um, clouds the ability to think rationally. Sure. <laughs> and so again, you're in the middle of all this fun and, uh, pleasure seeking and hedonism, hedonism. And it's very hard to then go, Oh, wait, my spouse is sitting at home, you know, doing laundry and here I am out for this great dinner. You know, you, you, you get very narrow focused and really, uh, oblivious to what else is happening around you. Yeah. Well, a lot of people get addicted to that rush of dopamine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of why, you know, if somebody might want to cheat just because of that, you know, they get, and like you just said, initially they get that, you know, dopamine rush and all of that's good and fun. And then all of a sudden yeah. things just kind of level off. But then again, it's just like, oh, I want this again. My, you know, your brain just, right. telling you, we got to go fight. We got to go find this. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I used to deal a lot with uh, drug addiction and education with kids sure. and, you know, the interesting thing about that is, yeah, that high, that great high when you first start and or maybe have a good experience with whatever substance you're using. But if you continue to use it, you're you're just continuing to seek that same high. Mm-hmm. And after a while, that tolerance builds up and it takes more and more to get the same high. And eventually you just have to have more and more just to feel not sick. Sure. You know? but, um, and so with the, with affairs and with, you know, doing something that you know is wrong, even though you're afraid to look at it or you don't want to look at it, you know, it's so fun initially and you're totally, people tend to be totally oblivious to who they're hurting, but they, they also have never told the story. Mm. And that's again, back to my book. I feel like the person that cheated deserves the opportunity to tell their story, to really tell their story. And most of them have never told, they may say, yeah, I had an affair for, you know, I had, I cheated on my wife for the last six months. Um, Or yeah, I had a one night stand with um, this guy when I was away on this meeting, but that's all they say. And so in therapy and in the book, you you push to tell the story, like what, what all happened? And the spouse typically or the significant other has a lot of questions and that's tough. I mean, they want it usually to have details like mm. how often did you rent a hotel room? Where did you have dinner? What was sex like? And there, it, in fairness, they should be able to ask those questions. But over time, those just bring up 
a lot of more pain and and misery and um, and scars. So so the person that cheated needs to be able to talk about all those things in a neutral place, so that they can then figure out when their significant other is asking them all those detailed questions. What are they really wanting to know? You know, are they really wanting to know if if they still feel love for the spouse, if they still feel love for the person they cheated with? Do they um, want to be different in their relationship? I mean, it just, it's important for the person that cheated to really sit with their sin and do kind of a confession <laughs> in yeah. a sense, because they they haven't said it out loud yeah. to anyone, the full story. You know, I'm one of these guys who have trust issues and you know, while you were saying that, you know, knowing the details of what the story was, like I was just thinking that, you know, if I were to be che get cheated on that, you know, if going through your five steps or whatever, would I still be able to forgive that person? Right. And yeah. And I'm wondering, is that this case by case or do you see that most people do? Case by case. Yeah. It has a lot to do with the sincerity of the person who cheated. If you're going to forgive them. I mean, and they have, there's a skill like you you know, if you were being cheated on, you definitely get to ask questions like, you know, what hotel room did you use? And, um, and, and, but yet when you even ask those questions, there's pretty, some pretty vivid imagery that comes to mind, right? Right. It's, it's going to affect your intimacy with your significant other, but you have to answer it to some point. But then at some point you have to be able to say to the, to your significant other, honey, I know I've answered these questions before and I know it's still in your head and I'm so sorry. Again, I'm so sorry for hurting you and lying to you and going behind your back. Um, it's a way of saying, I of reassuring them. I want to be here. I want to be in this relationship with you and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, and again, that's the courage that the cheater has to embrace and the humility of mm -hmm. it. You have to be able to to put your tail between your legs and admit guilt and not and it progressively again years later you may have to you may a movie may come on the tv and you and your spouse are sitting there and you think you've, you're in a great place and you see their face fall and you're like oh yep. that nerve just got hit yep. you know and so it just needs to be said out loud again wow that i think that movie reminded you of what i did to you 20 years ago yeah yeah. Is it one of those things too that, you know, cheating on a person? I mean, is it just, you know, like some guys are considered womanizers and stuff like that? Is it just, you know, part of genetics and DNA? They just have it in them. And that once a cheater, they're just going to keep cheating for life just because, you know, I've heard that argument too that, you know, there's, right. gotta, I just got to, you know, hey, we're, an, you know, we're technically animals. We want to spread our seed or whatever it is. And that just, you know, it's just part, and maybe that's just a lame excuse just to, you know, or a scapegoat or whatever you want to say. But I mean, do you feel it's just, it is probably genetically there or is it just? Not genetically. No, not genetically. It's environment. It's, it's been reinforced. You know, the, there's again, they got pleasure from their um, serial affairs and they have gotten little criticism from other people, perhaps, but a cheater is a cheater. Always a cheater is the question. And it, yes, if, they choose not to look at themselves. Is that I mean, it's a choice. Nature? nature versus nurture. Yeah, it's more about uh, nurture. Yeah, I mean, they're not born. You're not born. I mean, you you may have a parent that cheated, and you may have seen the effects of it, and it can have two different effects. It can make you like adamant that you will never cheat on your spouse, and having experienced it as a kid, or you may say, "Eh, they survived. Well, it's not that big a deal." I mean, everyone has their, their own experience, but there is this, the point is you have to be able to want to be different. I agree. Yeah. Well, here's a question. And we were, I was talking about this with a family member uh, was it last week, two weeks ago, something like that. But, you know, you just brought up kids or said something about a kid and that, you know, if, you know, parents are going through a divorce, do you see that? And this is just, philosophical thinking and that and I don't know if you've done any work with this that uh is it easier for a kid to have a young be young and have his family go through a divorce or be older and have his family go through a divorce yeah not you know I think um 
Yeah, the younger the kids are, the less memory they have of their parents together, of course. And they can normalize the two houses, et cetera. You know, it gets really tough as you get towards adolescence. Um, that's a tough time. Yeah. So you know, like before we were, we started recording, you know, I think my, I think I can't remember if I told you or not, but my, I was three when my parents got divorced. And, you know, when I was having this discussion that you know, I was like, well, you know, I really don't remember a lot. I just kind of went through life. It's like, oh, this is how life is. You know, I didn't really, right. you know, I just understood that, oh, dad's not living with us anymore, but this is, you know, this like, again, like I said, this is my life, but you know, I was trying to think about it if I were older, you know, you know, like you just talked about memory, that was a good point. But I mean, could I have made more sense of like who, you know, what's going on and actually talking about it and made more sense of it in my own head and not just being based on, you know, what people were telling, like, you know, what mom was telling me when I was spending time with her, what dad was telling me when yeah. I spent time with him. And then, you know, it's like, well, maybe I could have formed my own thinking rather than just have my brain as a sponge just soaking up all this information and not really being able to make sense of it all. Yeah. Yeah. But then even if you're 14 and you're hearing both sides of it, you're still going to be just okay. ticked off because your life is different, you know, and at age three, your life wasn't, you know, it became normal easily, but, um, you know, you still can, I don't know if your parents are still around, but you can still ask, yeah. you know, Hey, what happened? Tell me your story. I'm curious. Well, that's what I finally, you know, did when, you know, we get them, you know, by themselves and, you know, rather still around, but we get to hear, or I've gotten to hear both sides of the story, but yeah, you know, it's also one of those things that, you know, I guess, I mean, I don't know if they listen to this podcast or not, but it's one of those things that it's like, well, it's always the other person's fault. It's like, well, you know, I mean, I'm sure you had some issues too. That I, I never hear that side of the story. It's like, like you were talking about earlier, we're humans, we're not perfect. So right. I'm assuming you had some issues. Nobody wants to say that. It's always the other person's fault. And this is why it happened. This well, way. and I, I think there's a challenge know. with, we have a curiosity about the past, but I, I try to work in the present. So yep. it's really about how the press, the past is affecting you today. You know, what is it about your past that you think has shaped who you are, how you are, what you think, what you feel today? And so the question for your parents or anybody else would be like, so, you know, that divorce you had 40 years ago, you know, tell me what, tell me how you've changed or tell me what you learned from it or tell me what regrets you have. I mean, and again, you're not their therapist, so you may not want to do all that. <laughs> well, but, but that's one of the things I would like, you know, like, well, I want to have these conversations just to have those type of discussions just so I you know, I don't want to say it will give me peace of mind because, you know, like I, we just said, I've, I've accepted it. That's how things are, but yeah. it would still be nice to know that, oh, that's what you were thinking at the time. It just wasn't based on what person A said versus person B. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. And I want you to be curious and try. It's tough yeah. to be non-judgmental. Yeah, you know? you go, yeah. But it's more about um, how does it affect you today? You know, what is it? Cause yeah when they were, you know, 30 or 25 years old or whatever, they had their issues. You know, they were different people too, you know? Yeah. 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 Huh. But yeah, that's one thing that, and even why I've started this podcast was to help me articulate these things better and just get a better sense of, you know, honing my communication skills, if you will, just to mm -hmm. learn these things rather than just saying, Oh, okay. Well, oh, well, no worries. You know, and I want to have that curiosity and yeah. be able to, you know, learn from experts and learn from other people like to, you know, to say, Oh, that makes sense. I can kind of understand that now rather than just looking at it in one light. Right. Well, as a, as a trained therapist, you know, in, in my training that we went through, we we're, you know, taught the skills of reflection. How do you say back to a person what, you know, what you think you feel you're hearing them say about their feelings and their thoughts um, and about how to ask questions. And we certainly encourage people not to ask question why. Yeah. Because usually if I say, why did you do that? I, it's implied, or I usually have an answer I want you to give me, you sure. know? And so, you, you know, you're more likely. So to ask more about the what, who, how, when uh, questions are, are sometimes uh, safer, uh, create a better atmosphere to sharing yeah, that kind of thing. Well, most people, 
I mean, is there anything you do special to make, you know, because I feel like most people just don't come in and just start sharing right off the bat or do, I mean, or do they, I mean, do they? Just, well, you know, there's a lot, they say there's a lot that happens between the phone the call, day. making the appointment when they, and then they actually walk in the door. Wow. They've already started the therapy before they walked in the door. Mm. You know, most people are paying out of their pocket or their insurance and they want to make, get the most out of it. Sure. So they're going to come in and you open up with, so what brings you here? What's going on? And most people go, don't say, I don't know. I mean, they say, here's what my issues are. Um, here's what I want to, you know, talk about. So it's a pretty safe place. It's a little different in social situations or like in dating situations, you know, because people are going to be more guarded, uh, not sure if they're going to be comfortable sharing too much of themselves. Do you find yourself, I mean, even walking outside of the office when you're not even inside the office, you're getting bombarded with questions and just trying to get this advice when you're not even like technically at work. And, and the reason I'm asking that is because, you know, like I was telling you before, I teach Carl or coach CrossFit on the side. Yeah. But if I go to the grocery store, I might see somebody I know and immediately just, Hey man, I, I plan on coming back, you know, uh, the same yeah. I was like, okay, that's fine, dude. I mean, yeah. I, I, do we, or they ask you, what should I eat this? Yeah. Right? yeah. They're like, Look at what I have in my cart or whatever. Right. Don't, worry, don't worry about it. I mean, I'm, just a person, yeah. you know, don't worry about, you know, whatever I have in here, that cheesecake. <laughs> it's yeah. Well, but that I mean, sounds like you have done a good job. Like I have had to do of letting go. I mean, people yeah. uh, will get what they need and, and they all have their own story. And so you try to be present with them when they do show up yeah. and um, you know what they do in between. I don't know, but I think it's, 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 um, it's okay. I, I, I have been in this profession long enough and as part of my, I'm able to have the language. I'm so grateful for the skills. So I do have, you know, intimate relationships with lots of friends and family and, um, and my husband of many 45 years. And so it's, it's lucky. I mean, I'm really blessed that I have these skills because again, that to communicate empathy and how to ask questions, you have to practice that stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, you you just said it was lucky. I don't think it. You know, I mean, I guess there could be luck to it, but I mean, it's no. I mean, it's yeah, but I mean, like you know, like it's one of those things we were talking about. You know, with those skills and everything, you actually know how to. You know, I don't know if there's any expert or master manual on having a relationship, but I think you got a kind of a better sense more than you know most people do, and that you know yeah. you, you're not you're not afraid to have those tough conversations with your husband or whatever. So yeah, right. I mean, you yeah, would you say forty five years? That's impressive. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know it's fun. It's fun. It's it's fun to meet new people too, and it's fun to just in, you know, live in a new community. I we just moved to Philadelphia, and and it's it's fun meeting people and to say, tell me your story. I'm curious who you are, and you know they don't necessarily know I'm a therapist, and that's cool. Um, but you know they most of us don't are you know it's flattering to have somebody interested in you. It's, it's, sure. It opens doors. You're like, well, if you're interested. <laughs> well, do, do you always do you refrain from saying that you're a therapist just because, you know, what is it that if you said, hey, you know, I'm a therapist or whatever, people are like, oop, I'm going to shut up right now. I'm not saying that anymore for the rest of the evening. Um, I kind of wait for them to say, well, so what do you do? Or okay, they, that'd and be then fun. they'll go, oh, now I get it. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be fun. This is because, you know, like you start, you know, obviously you're really good at it so it's just like oh you know have to start listening to what people are really doing and how they're talking well, i'm not psychoanalyzing people i mean i definitely make sure in a conversation socially that it's a back and forth whereas as a therapist i would only focus on you the client sure okay but in a social lights you know they'd say oh here's what i did today and i go oh here's what i did today you know i mean make sure it's it's balanced yeah yeah, and, I'm not trying to get in people's heads unless yeah. they ask me to. So, I mean, kind of, you know, go, switching gears. I mean, is is this what you always wanted to do? I know you said you worked with, you know, drug abuse a little bit earlier, but was there always planned was to work with professionals? Uh oh, kid, I was going to be a journalist and and writer, and then I got to college and I got a C in English, so I thought, <laughs> oh. well, so then the course, so I switched gears into education and uh, started working with kids with behavior problems. And got to do a lot of interesting things with them, but so quickly learned that I really wasn't that interested in teaching reading, writing, arithmetic. Mm. I was more interested in their behaviors and their emotions. So then I got my degree and then my husband, we kept moving and got more degrees. And uh, yeah, just these experiences. I just really love hearing, you know, it's such a privilege to hear people's stories and to to walk through their grief or pain with the people. Um, 
so yeah, it's been a journey that I, and then to come full circle now and to actually write my book and uh, publish it, it was like, ah, see, I can write. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, I think it's a good start, place to take this home right there that, uh, a good way to end this. So if people want to find you, if they want to find your book or anything yeah. you want to plug, feel free to do that. Yeah. Um, is this audio or video? Or both? Uh, we do both. So Okay. Well, here's my book. It's called More Than Sorry. And so my website is uh, www.drdebmiller.com. D-R is in doctor, Deb, D-E-B, and Miller, M-I-O. And on that website, you can find a link to my book on Amazon and, um, and my services. I, yeah, I see a few people virtually, but not much. Cool. Well, yeah. wait, that's a good question that... And I've, I've asked people this on here that, you know, if we were to do this podcast in person compared to via Zoom, I mean, do you think it's a different, I don't want to say vibe or energy, but do you th think people would react different based on just being in person rather than through a screen? Hmm. You have any thoughts I don't on know. That? I mean, I've been doing in-person presentations to other therapists, Yeah, but not, I mean, Zoom, I haven't had the privilege of that since um, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But if you want to organize something, Chris, I'll show up. Sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. Like I, I've had somebody ask me that too. And I always thought that because I've done a couple podcasts in person and it's like, no, that went really well. But I mean, they've also also or also gone well on Zoom too. But I just kind of wonder that would I be the same person in person via Zoom? I hope that just made sense. That's what I was trying yeah. to say. Yeah. No, you get energy. You get definitely would get energy from the like, audience. Body language a little bit more. and see Yeah. 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 True. Well, well thanks. thanks for the privilege. This was fun having this conversation. Good. No, I really enjoyed it. I got a few good little pearls and gems and tidbits that I can share along with the others. So, uh, good. Again, again, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. Well, I appreciate the time. Okay. All right, folks. We're out of here, folks. See you. Bye.